Hi, my name is Sophie Virkes. I'm a research and teaching assistant at Ghent University, and I work on relationships, more specifically collaboration between media, science and politics. And in tune with the topic of this panel, I'll be talking about outsiders, being scientists and policymakers entering the news production process. A topic that just so happens to have been put center stage during the past COVID-19 crisis. These two tired looking men here are a news anchor and urologist, and they've been working more closely than ever during the past year and a half. And in Belgium, at least, there have been so many interesting dynamics between journalists, scientists, but also politicians. I would have loved to have been in that studio and observed those dynamics firsthand, but as is the nature of COVID, I was at home studying my own little piece of the puzzle, a large scale citizen science project on traffic related air pollution that was set up by a newspaper, university and environmental government agency. One of the most popular ways of discussing the relationship between these three social actors has been through mediatization. From an institutionalist perspective, this refers to the process in which media have become social institutions with their own logics and other institutions adapt to this logic using things like news values and storytelling techniques. Of course, these other institutions do not simply comply to the rules of media, but attempt to manage it and use the media to their own advantage. At the same time, media institutions themselves have also adopted logics from other social fields like medicine or politics. And this all creates a complex entanglement of different logics and professional practices. It's of course this entanglement and complexity that interests us as media linguists. It makes you wonder how language is contextualized as it travels across boundaries of time, text, context and media, and in this case specifically across boundaries of media science and politics. It's also interesting to see how media outlets and journalists deal with this mediatization in the context of ongoing challenges, such as commercial pressure, large information flows and loss of authority. Recent studies have shown how these challenges have led to a new sense of reflexivity in newsrooms and urged journalists to innovate their own practices. Collaborative journalism can be seen as such an innovation. This can be different newsrooms working together, but it can also be outsiders entering the newsroom and joining the news production process. Think of user-generated content or, as with our citizen science project, co-production with actors of the very field that the reporters are covering. So in our case, journalists wanted to work on air quality and combined forces with scientists and policymakers to do so. Together, they asked citizens to measure NO2, analyze this data, and then publish the results in the newspaper. I was there to witness this all in about seven months of field work in which I joined meetings, observed a newsroom, and conducted interviews. Among other things, I've been interested in how this collaboration is reflected or even impactful on the news production process and product. With somewhat dissolving boundaries between producing and consuming news, it can sometimes seem as if we're dealing with an infinitely expanding production process or a never ending product, which to me as a researcher at least feels a bit daunting. That brings me to my second question, which is figuring out ways to combine ethnography of the news production process with discourse analysis of the news product. Here, I tackle this problem by analyzing the news product within the institutional context of the news production process. Here's how I went about doing that. During my field work, I noticed how my informants kept bringing up a number of news items on air quality written by the same journalists a year earlier in 2017, outside of the collaboration. So I decided those news items were the one produced within the collaboration in 2018, using a multimodal discourse analysis. I combined this with an analysis of field notes and recordings and went back and forth between those different sets of data. So here's what I found. In comparison with the 2017 news items, the 2018 news items in collaboration with the scientists and policymakers tended to show more nuanced coverage of scientific results containing very specific language and a neutral tone. There also tended to be more focus on the scientific background of air pollution rather than any underlying political issues. Here's an example, two articles on the health effects of air pollution. The 2017 article uses broad terms, we're dying, we're losing months of our lives, there's devastation to our health. The 2018 article is more specific, it's not air pollution, it's car addiction. We're no longer dying, we're ill, even more specific, we've got asthma, heart attacks and lung cancers. 
When we connect this finding to our fieldwork, though, we get a bit of a different reading. Several scientists mentioned their frustration with sensational language and scare terms in the 2017 news items. In this interview, the lead scientist explains how making a positive campaign and moving away from how many are dropping dead from the sky was a make or break point for him in the collaboration. This brings us to our second research question. How does our approach shed new light on the news product or production process? Well, if we continue with our earlier example, it allowed us to trace back the differences to what we saw in the field and see how a shift from broad to specific language is also about a shift away from sensational language to neutral and nuanced tones. Our approach also showed how this collaboration also spurred on reflexivity and negotiations on the actor's own and each other's discursive practices. In this next example, a scientist is asked about the political tension between different air quality thresholds by a journalist. And after pushing back on the question for a while, the scientist attempts to shape the message. He starts off with, it seems like there are effects, but is immediately met with a hesitant response from the journalist. He then quickly rephrases by dropping the modal verb to, there are effects. This short interaction shows a metapragmatic awareness of which of which linguistic features are suitable for news language and which aren't. The metapragmatic awareness can be interpreted in terms of mediatization. The scientists and policymakers do not simply adapt to, but attempt to manage the media logic of news value and storytelling techniques typical of the news. And as a response, the journalists made some discursive changes in their writing style. As collaboration and participation are becoming more frequent in newsrooms and other societal institutions, more research is needed on how they affect these mediatization processes and the production of institutional discourse. Looking deeper into the metapragmatic awareness displayed here could be a good starting point.